like a wild stallion, a canoe must be kept on a tight rein. The canoe is not a lifeless, inanimate object. It feels very much alive. Alive with the life of the river. Difficult rapids are descended slowly. The paddle remains in the water with the weight leaning on the blade for stability and balance. Using pries and draws, the canoe is sideslipped back and forth to line up with the deep water channel. Sometimes the deep water is not visible until very close to the brink of a sharp drop. A strong backwater sculling slows the canoe to buy time to choose a course. A back brace stabilizes the canoe, and the pry sideslips the canoe into position above the next deep water channel. against the seat with the knees spread wide, canoe and canoeist become one. Change sides well in advance of the danger area. That one was late, but lucky. At the bottom of the rapids, it's often necessary to remove some of the dampness picked up along the way. The packs are equipped with plastic liners, so a little water isn't too much of a problem. If the packs are secured only by a tether, rather than being lashed in, emptying is much easier. When emptying in shallow water, tilt the canoe past the perpendicular so that only the canoe is lifted and not the water. Never stand in a canoe, someone once said. And the old adage persists even today. Now it is true that you shouldn't attempt it above a rapid until you are very familiar with the position. But the improvement of the view beyond the brink is considerable. If the deep water channel is not obvious, the rapids are surveyed from the safety of the shore. A sculling draw side slip avoids the possibility of drifting broadside onto hidden rocks. What lies on the bottom of a rapid is written all over the surface. Estimating where the rocks are and the location of the deep water channel is called reading the rapids. The ability to read rapids begins with an understanding of what causes a rapid. Above the rapids, the slow-moving water flows undisturbed. As the drop of the river increases, rocks beneath the surface cause turbulence just downstream. The smooth water flowing over the rock is called a pillow, but these pillows have hard centers. With a further acceleration in the current, the turbulence breaks into waves or rollers that curl towards the rock. The wave isn't much of a problem, but the rock in front of it sure is. An increase in rate of flow causes a corresponding increase in the size of the wave. There is now sufficient depth to float the canoe over the rock 
and the downstream wave isn't large enough to worry about. With a further increase in current, evidence of small rocks disappears, while the larger rocks cause proportionately larger waves. If the volume of water is great enough, a souse hole is created. A very difficult obstacle to get through without swamping or rolling. The deep water channel between the rocks resembles a V pointing downstream. A rapid is considered easily navigable if the Vs are clearly defined and aligned in such a way that the canoe can follow them. In larger rapid, the fast water of the V, hitting the slower water downstream, throws up standing waves or haystacks. Size varies with volume and speed of the current. There is usually a procession of them aligned downstream, like a roller coaster. Haystacks are a deep water wave and easily runnable, if not too large. The difference between a haystack and a curling wave caused by a rock is quite obvious, especially if the rock is big enough to cause a souse hole. From upstream, a souse hole appears as a straight line with foaming water beyond, a place to be avoided in an open canoe unless it is equipped with a spray deck. But you better not count on it. The spray deck is only a compromise between an open canoe and a specialized white water canoe. The spray deck helps, but only a good solid brace will get you through a souse hole. Rocks sticking above the surface are easier to avoid, but can be dangerous if you broadside onto one. Here's that moment of panic when the hands go for the gunnels. Keep that upstream gunnel high to avoid swamping and back paddle off into the eddy. In this position, the canoe is irretrievable. The force exerted by the canoe against the rock is almost a ton. Between the rock and the canoe is not a good place to be. A swamp canoe in shallow rock-studded rapids is a killer. Stay well upstream and out of the way. Canvas canoes break up faster, but they do have other advantages, like kindling a fire before the long walk home. Not all rocks are bad, though. You'll find eddies of calm water behind them in the midst of the worst of rapids. To break into the eddy, pass the rock as closely as possible. Reach out and plant the paddle in the eddy and draw the bow around into the calm water. The canoe can be held in the back eddy as long as you want. To leave the eddy, stick the bow out into the current, hold the stern in the eddy while leaning downstream in a flat brace, and allow the surge of the current to do the turning. A curling wave stretching part or all the way across the river indicates a ledge. The difficulty of running a ledge varies dramatically with changes in the water level.
the ledge in low water. The same ledge in medium flow conditions and in spring flood. In high water, there is no danger of hitting any rocks. The problem is staying afloat in the haystacks. In low water, a ledge can be run only if there is a gap in it, indicated by a V of deep, fast water. If the depth of the water is questionable, the packs are removed to increase buoyancy. A 50-foot recovery line is a good idea, but it can be dangerous. Floating rope cuts the risk of entanglement, and a belt knife is nice to have, just in case. The rope is stowed away tightly with only a few feet left loose. For running rapids, a good life jacket is about as indispensable as a couple of traveling companions to assist in case of injury. In low water, take it slowly in case you hit something. In high water, the problem is to break through the curling wave without swamping. The pack sacks help to stabilize the canoe, but at the expense of buoyancy. In spring flood, the greatest danger to the canoeist is the deadly cold water. A wetsuit top must be worn next to the skin. Failure to hit the apex of the V almost rolls the canoe, but a paddle brace into the wave keeps the canoeist dry. Another rapid in full flood. It is caused by a four-foot ledge extending all the way across the river. In low water conditions, it is very easy because of a break in the ledge which forms a perfect V. In low water, the ledge is no problem. In high water, it's a killer. Several people have died in this rapid, not because they tried to run it, but because they were swept into it by accident. In high water, the approach to a chute can become very dangerous as the water races to the brink. The most important maneuver for Wild River canoeing, the eddy turn. It's called eddying out. It enables you to get off the river when you don't like what you see up ahead. If the portage is on the other side of the river, the canoe can be ferried across the current. The upstream ferry is the strongest. The canoe is propelled forward against the current and then drawn across the river at a slight angle. The force of the current on the side of the canoe assists in the ferry. Lean the canoe downstream and use the back eddies behind the rocks. For a more aggressive but risky method of crossing the current, power out of the eddy and across the current as quickly as possible. Finish the traverse with an eddy entry on the opposite shore. The back ferry is used if a downstream run is to follow. The upstream end of the canoe must be unweighted by moving forward or it will swing around in the current. Backwater sculling holds the canoe upstream at the proper angle while making the traverse. When the canoe is in the desired position, the downstream run begins.
The more portages you can put between yourself and civilization, the greater the sense of stepping back into time and history. It's a good feeling and worth all the difficulties. The wilder the river, the less likely you'll run into people like this. not enough people know or care about wild rivers, the ones that still remain will soon be gone too, silenced forever. narrows between rocky shores, roller coaster haystacks indicate deep, fast water. Where it widens out again, we find haystacks rolling and breaking upstream. Rocks hidden in the haystacks betray their presence. And extending out from shore, a ledge. In low water, the rapid is not difficult. But in high water, most of the river funnels into a souse hole caused by the ledge. Over on the right, the rock garden that was exposed in low water is now buried. The strategy is to hang tight to the right shore. Three feet more to the left, and it's game over. The purpose of a wilderness journey is not to get from the top of a river to the bottom, but to enjoy the river and adapt to its ever-changing moods by poling, lining, wading, and portaging. The cord tied permanently to the center thwart quickly secures the blade ends for portaging. The canoe is lifted in three stages. Stand it on edge with one hand on the center of the thwart. Heave it up onto the thighs and grab the far gunnel. Then roll it up, step under it, and you're off.
one of the dangers of running rapids is that it's habit forming. This rapid could easily be portaged, but there is something alluring about a difficult rapid, and you can't help wondering if you shouldn't try. There is a limit, though, to what is possible in an open canoe. The really big stuff is for covered whitewater canoes, along with crash helmets and rescue crews. This is one of those borderline rapids. It's a long one, and there are souse holes. However, the downstream Vs are there, even if somewhat obscure and hard to read. But with someone along to help pick up the pieces, the lure is irresistible. clear of the canoe is a swimmer's first concern. The second is keeping the feet up near the surface to avoid entrapment between rocks. Given the choice, swim to shore as soon as possible. Failing that, don't attempt to recover the canoe until you reach deep water. White water techniques can make a difficult rapid navigable, but the risks can never be completely eliminated. Most canoeing organizations are against canoeing alone and they're probably right. The recreational paddler is well advised to travel in the company of other canoeists, especially when paddling solo. Even though prospectors and trappers often live to a ripe old age paddling alone, it is unlikely they would have been fooling around in long dangerous rapids. The age of the canoe as a vehicle of trade and commerce is gone forever. Today, the canoe has become a means of rediscovering the natural world. And like the Ojibwe and Cree before us, there should be no evidence to tell that we have passed this way, other than the imprint of our feet along the Portage Trail. Thank you.